Now, um, it's going back a number of years um, when I was at a meeting of some very, very high-profile uh, Christian leaders, and, and some of them you would know, but I'm not going to tell you who was actually in the room. Uh, and what happened in that meeting is that there was a moment when the voices started getting raised and raised and raised. Uh, and this was a group of, of Christian leaders. Uh, and then something really, really significant happened, which is one of the people uh, that was there intercepted by saying, we don't speak like that here. Uh, and there was sort of like a, a, a pause uh, for a moment. Uh, I suppose it was an opportunity for the leaders in the room to just kind of think about what they had been saying and how they had been saying it. Uh, and then the meeting sort of uh, ensued, it carried on uh, in a really, really calm manner. And, uh, and I think about that moment throughout my ministry, uh, how significant it is uh, the way that we speak. Because words are powerful. They can be a source to build people up, to encourage people, to bring comfort, to bring healing. Uh, I just want to give you one, one example of some words that I was really, really touched by this, this week. It was from Simon Cunningham, uh, the ministry leader at our Hatch End site. He sent an email uh, to Marjorie, our administrator at Hatch End, and this is how he ended his email. Many thanks for all you do for the church. And I, and I spoke to Simon about it. I said, that was a really, really good thing that you did. How much encouragement that must have brought her, particularly when you start to think about the fact that he's just stepped into this role uh, and, and is bringing some leadership and oversight there, and yet he speaks nicely to Marjorie, our administrator. But as we know, words can also be used to tear people down, to criticize, to make comments which are not helpful. And this reminds me of last week's news where a comedian by the name of Tony Hinchcliffe disrespected Puerto Ricans at a Trump rally. Uh, it's no surprise that his racist slur uh, sparked fury amongst both Republicans and Democrats. Words are powerful. Uh, they can be used for good, but they can also be used for bad. And, and, and as I reflect on that meeting uh, that I, uh, I was part of some years ago where these Christian leaders were speaking in a way that really they shouldn't have been speaking, it, it, it reminded me that for each of us as followers of Christ, we can sometimes overlook the importance of the way that we speak. I think sometimes in church we, we don't take seriously the fact that there are sins of speech. Uh, I, I think we sometimes overlook it. Uh, and what James says uh, uh, in his letter is that we mustn't overlook it. As Christians, we're called to a countercultural way of life. Yes, we're called to live in the world, but we're not called to be like the world. Uh, and sometimes the, the culture finds its way filtering into the church, and we don't do anything about that, and that is not right. So I want us to look at um, the power of speech, uh, the power of our words. Uh, I'm going to be reading from James 3, verses 1 to 12. Uh, the title of my message is Taming the Tongue, uh, and today is the final part uh, in our four-part sermon series on James. The words will come up on the screen behind me. So James 3, verses 1 to 12. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, which wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things." How great a forest to set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. 
The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird or reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Now hear me when I say this. Uh, this passage, uh, well, I can't remember the last time when a passage has weighed so heavily on me uh, as I have been preparing. And I think that is in part because I know that I have failed on so many occasions to live up to God's standards in this area. But I suppose it weighs heavily on me because I also know that this is an issue within the church. And you might say, you sure about that, Manoj? Yes, because just last week I was speaking to three individuals that are part of three other churches where this is an issue. It saddens me that the way Christians speak hurts the church. It can cause division, it can cause disunity, uh, it can cause hurt and pain, uh, it can leave many, many people feeling unappreciated or taken for granted, uh, and I think on some occasions it is nothing short of bullying. And so the message that I'm bringing to you today from this passage, it's a serious one. And to get a sense of its relevance for our own lives, it might help us to briefly consider what James says in the preceding chapters. Let's just look back to James 1.1. So I think that that is really, really significant for each of us. What it says in that verse, or, or who James is addressing in that verse, is to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. And I think that that is a really, really important detail because effectively what James is doing is he's speaking to Christians everywhere. You know, the scattered Christians, wherever you are, James is speaking to them. And so this is a letter that is significant to the church at large. It's not like he's writing a letter to a specific church looking at a particular issue. He's saying, look, all of you Christians, wherever you are, this letter is important to you, and so we are the audience to this letter. Uh, and this being the case, James is quick to get across one of the primary themes that underpins the purpose of this letter, and we see that in chapter 1, verse 22. Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves, do what it says. Uh, I, I think it's also interesting, that verse, in light of what we've just read. If you've heard what James has just said, then do what the Word says. In other words, don't make the mistake of deceiving yourselves into believing that you are further on in your faith than you truly are, because I think that that is the mistake that I've often made. It comes from a place of arrogance, whereas we need humility. Let me, let me put it this way. Imagine that I preach to you today on the fruit of the Spirit, and one of the fruits of the Spirit is kindness, uh, and you've heard the Word of God say, be kind. Now, imagine that I heard that Word, and then I go out to church, and I start speaking unkindly to people. What kind of faith could that possibly be? And so it's no wonder that even people like the Apostle Paul said, you need to examine your faith. Uh, this is what he said to the church in Corinth. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Isn't that an interesting phrase? Examine yourselves. Yes, you might be coming to church. Yes, you might be singing songs. Yes, you might be giving every week. And yet Paul would still say to all of us, examine our faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you unless, of course, you fail the test? And so likewise, what James is doing is he's bringing a reminder to Christians to monitor their faith, to scrutinize their faith. And this is what James goes on to say in chapter 2, verse 26. Faith without works 
is dead. Uh, and so that's where he's really coming to. He's saying, look, you've got this faith, but are you living out your faith? Uh, Joshua last week said that we're justified by faith. Uh, and what that means is that we're put right with God through faith in Jesus Christ. But Joshua also explained that our faith needs to be a genuine faith. And how do we know that it's a genuine faith? Well, if we're living out our faith in doing good works. So faith without works is dead. The point I'm making is that if our works reflects our faith uh, and, and our works is our deeds and our actions, well, obviously that incorporates our words as well. Uh, and so one of the measures by which uh, we can determine the quality of our faith is through our words. The, you know, the words actually say a lot about us. They reveal what is going on in our hearts, who we are as people. So actually, just coming to church is not really a mark of a faith, is it? It's actually what is coming out of us and the fruit that is born out of what we say and do. And words really are important because James says this in chapter 1, verse 26. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Whoa, that's a strong word, isn't it? In other words, if someone is unable to keep a check or a rein on their tongue, it could possibly be the case that one's religion is worthless. In short, what James is saying is, look, words absolutely matter. And James makes this very point in Matt, sorry, uh, Jesus makes this very point in Matthew 12, verses 36 to 37. And this is what Jesus says. I tell you on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. I wonder if you're sort of living in the reality of this. I, I certainly am not because I, I, I fell short of God's standards this morning, but Maria absolutely loved it. She said, said Manoj, what are you preaching on today? Oh, is it James, is it? So uh, she's been loving the fact that I'm, I'm doing this one. So, so if we're not really living in the reality of this, if we don't see you know, our, our words as that significant or that important, then we really need to hear what James has to say from chapter 3. So let's start looking at today's passage. In verse 1, James says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Now, did you know that for people like me, or, 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 or for some people, that there are different degrees of judgment? That for people like me who hold this ministry of unpacking the word, we will be judged with greater strictness. And the obvious reason is that if I'm unpacking Scripture, then I've got to seek to be faithful uh, in doing so, so that I don't mislead others. But I think in all of this is a, is a big lesson to all those people that want to be preachers and teachers, not to go into that ministry lightly, to understand the importance and the responsibility that that carries, and not to get involved in doing it for the wrong motives, like, I want a bit of recognition, I want a bit of status in the church. If you're doing it for that reason, then that's all wrong. And so for me personally, I realize that, you know, in this context, when I'm, when I'm leading and preaching, or if I'm in a meeting, or, or pastorally, or if I'm at home, that God is looking at my words, and that God is calling me to a high standard. We're using the words of James 1, 19, I must be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Oh my goodness. How I have failed on so many occasions to live out that verse. But actually, it's not really a surprise that I struggle in this area because what James goes on to say in chapter 3, verse 2 is this, for we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man and able also to bridle his whole body. 
I think the significance of what James is saying in that verse should not be overlooked. On one level, he's just being realistic. He's basically saying, look, we all struggle in this area. In the sins of speech, we're all going to fall short of the glory of God. And that might reflect itself in a variety of different ways. Maybe in anger or gossip or criticism or insincere insincere comments or maybe exaggeration of the truth or manipulation. Sometimes we're manipulating people and don't even realize that we're doing that. Maybe it's going to be reflected in lying or harsh words or cursing or, or bitterness or innuendo or impurity or flattery for personal gain. Uh, maybe you'll guard the way that you speak, but then you might not be doing so in the way that you use words when you text or email or, 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 or make comments on, on social media. The point being that we all stumble. And in saying this, James appears to be wanting us to, to confront the reality of who we are, to actually get to that point of realizing, oh my goodness, we all stumble. And that's important. Because if you don't know that you stumble, you're not going to do anything about it. And so James is saying, look, this is an issue. Confront the reality of who you are so that you can do something about it. So that you will stumble less. Let's not forget that James's letter is a call to action. That's what it is. It's a call to action. Do something about it. To use the words of James himself, not to do anything is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror, but then goes away and at once forgets what he was like. And so we all stumble, and James is saying, you need to do an honest appraisal of your weakness so that you can do something about that area of our lives. And then James moves on to expound the seriousness of not doing anything. So if you don't want to do anything, this is going to be the ramifications. So verses 3 to 6. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they're so large and are driven by strong winds, they're guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. And so James is talking through the impact of the tongue. And how does he do this? He he does this by using three examples to basically emphasize the same point. So as you're aware, a, a bit in a horse, is a, it's, it, it's, a, it's a metal bar, it's put in the horse, uh, and through that you can control uh, the behavior, uh, uh, the movement of this big and powerful animal. And likewise, a ship will have a rudder, it's a, it's a small object when you can consider the scale uh, and the size of a ship, and yet the rudder is able to navigate uh, the ship. And, and equally, you know, a, a, a small fire, it's small in size, Uh, but a small fire is capable of starting a wildfire. Uh, And we can certainly see examples of that through global warning. And so the point being that whilst the bit, the rudder, and the small fire are not large in size, their effect can be far-reaching. And James sees the tongue in light of these illustrations. For he says, so also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. So what we say does have far-reaching impact. And in terms of that, um, and in terms of the far-reaching impact which the tongue can have, this is conveyed in James not saying that the tongue is like a fire, but that the tongue is a fire. Well, a fire can basically destroy a whole forest. And our tongues can be damaging and destructive as well. And I think some of the crisis that we're looking at, you know, in our world is as a result of basically verbal abuse. Lots of people struggling with their mental health because of the words that they have, that they've had spoken to them 
uh, or the words that they've read on social media. You know, we know that rhyme very, very well, don't we? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words shall never hurt me. <laughs> How wrong that is. In a piece entitled The Neuroscience Behind Our Words, it says the following, negative words, whether spoken, heard, or thought, not only cause situational stress, but also contribute to long-term anxiety. Now, this is what the research says. And I've come to realize that sometimes I'm that person that is saying those, those negative comments. And that is the impact of my words on other people. It's causing them situational stress and long-term anxiety. Words do hurt. And therefore, it's no surprise that, the Bible, uh, uh, that one Bible commentator describes the tongue as an actual power for evil. And you might think, well, that's a strong word. But just think about the accumulative effect of our words on people. Yeah, a comment here, a, a, a criticism there, a, a harsh word there. When you start to think about the cumulative effect of our words, how damaging they can be on others. But here is the point. It's not just the recipient that suffers, actually. It's actually the one who is dishing out the words as well. Because it says in verse 6, the, the tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. The word staining the whole body makes the point that everywhere the tongue makes its presence felt, it leaves its stain both on the person that is dishing it out and on all the other people that have to sort of hear those words, it also impacts them as well. Now, when James says, and set on fire by hell, that's an interesting phrase. He's not simply saying that sinful words are anti-God, but actually he's saying that they are pro-Satan. As Alec Motya puts it, the tongue becomes the instrument of Satan himself. Think about that for a moment. When we're speaking in a way that is not glorifying God, where we're doing nothing less than the devil's work. After all, has Satan not come to steal and to destroy? But as we read in the Bible, how Satan controls one's speech is not always easily identifiable. And I think there's one example in the Bible that really, really shows this clearly. So if you look at Matthew 16, and there's Jesus, and he's talking about his impending death on the crucifixion, and, and how does Peter respond? Well, he's upset, he's angry, and he says, this shall never happen to you. That's what he says to Jesus. Um, but Jesus can see past what is going on. Yes, Peter might be expressing possibly a genuine concern, but Jesus can see the reality of what is happening. And so Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And I suppose I'm bringing that example to you just to help us to understand that the way that the, you know, that the devil operates is in a very, very sly way. We need to guard our hearts so that we can guard what we say, lest we become a mouthpiece for him. You know, recently, uh, my daughter, Charney, uh, had all these albums in our kitchen, and she was opening them all, and she said, oh, do you want to look at this one and that one? Now, one thing that my family should hopefully know by now, I do not like looking at family pictures. So as soon as the albums come out uh, of my past, when the kids were little, it reminds me of my life before I was a Christian, and I cannot look at them. I walk away. I do not look at family pictures because what they remind me is actually of my speech, the sin of speech, how I use speech to manipulate uh, and to lie and to cause, cause a lot of damage in the lives of people. And those were words that cannot be undone. James also goes on to say this, for every kind of beast and bird or reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. And I was thinking about that. That's true, isn't it? 
You can go to these activities and you can see dolphins that have been tamed. You go to circuses and you can see these wild animals that have been tamed. And yet, what James is saying is the human tongue cannot be tamed. But I like the precision uh, of James's words. Notice what he says, no human being can tame the tongue. Which reminded me that with God, all things are possible. And so we, we come to the practical application uh, of my message. It's simply no good <laughs> trying in your own strength uh, to use the words that you know God wants you to use. You just can't get there in your own strength. Because James has already said to us that no human being can tame the tongue. And so that means that it's only with the help of God that we can speak in a way that brings him honor and glory. And, and I think a passage of scripture that might help us to sort of break this down is actually the day of Pentecost. Uh, in Acts 2, Peter was there preaching boldly uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. But think back to the way he was speaking before Jesus' crucifixion. He denied Jesus three times. And yet there he is speaking to the crowds. Uh, as I mentioned at the start of this service, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus. And he was pleading with them and he was, he was warning them that they need to come into the faith. Now, how did that transformation happen? It happened through the power of the Holy Spirit. And don't you find it interesting that one of the first signs in the new creation that we read of on the day of Pentecost was the renewal of speech. So God can help us in how we communicate. You know, yesterday I was in this church for a little while. I'd gone into London. Uh, like going into London. I do the boring thing of going outside a Baptist church and praying. Done it about six times now in the last seven weeks. But I came in here and I knelt there, and I like, that's my favorite spot, kneel in front of the communion table like this, touch touch the cross at the end, but I'm praying. And you know what I prayed for yesterday? Lord, I need your spirit because I can't do it in my own strength. I must have repeated that about 20 times in my prayer. Lord, I need your spirit. Help me to be the person that you want me to be. And I, I'm sharing that with you because I think some, some Christians have overlooked the importance of the spirit. We can't do this Christian life in our own strength. We will fail miserably. And it's about inviting God's presence into those areas of struggle. And sometimes you might not see the radical change that you want, because I know there are areas of my life where I haven't seen God bring me to the place where I want to be, but I've certainly seen the change over the course of time as I've been coming to God, confronting the reality of, of who I am, and asking God's Spirit to be at work in my life. Now, it's up to you. I'm sharing this message with you. It's up to you whether you want to do anything. You can leave this church today and say, yeah, we worship God and, and forget about the way I speak for the rest of the week. But if you do that, <laughs> then I think you have to realize that this is the kind of person you're going to become. So I'm going to read from verses 9 to 10. With it, as in the tongue, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, as in the tongue, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Let's be careful <laughs> that we just don't end up becoming Christians, that come into church and praise God and then forget about how they use their tongue throughout the week. And, and, and the way that James unpacks this point is by saying that a tree or vine doesn't produce different kinds of fruit. And yet, our speech has the power to produce both good and evil. Far be, it that we use, uh, uh, far be it that we should use our tongue to sing God's praises and then use the same tongue to speak ill of someone who is made in the image of God. And who is made in the image of God? Well, look around the room, all of us. That means that God demands and commands us to speak lovingly and kindly and gently to one another, but who else is made in the image of God? Well, all the people that you're going to meet outside this church building, them as well, to speak kindly to them. I want to conclude 
with this. Proverbs 18:21 says this, death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. The tongue can be used as a weapon of harm or a tool to build and heal and show love. This is the power that we all hold in our tongue. And as you reflect upon this, heed the words of Ephesians 4, 29. Do not let any, I love that word, any, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Make sure what you say brings benefit. If it doesn't, don't say it at all. In fact, I'm just going to conclude with this quick. Um, Whereas a film I was watching, is it Otto, is it? Otto, have you seen Otto, any of you, on Netflix? Yeah, isn't that an amazing film? Oh, brilliant. Go home. If you're not doing anything this afternoon, go and, go and watch it. I'm a bit of a romantic as well, so, aren't I, Maria? Yeah, I'm a bit of a romantic, aren't I, there? <laughs> she would have said no, but she's saying yes. Don't lie in God's church, Maria, yeah. Uh, but, uh, but there's this beautiful moment in, in Otto. Um, he's reflecting back on his life, uh, this guy, and um, he invites this, uh, um, this woman uh, for dinner, and, um, and, and you know, he's, he's got flowers first, it's beautiful, and, and they sit down, and they're talking about all kinds of things, and then at one moment, uh, 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 you know, during that scene, she says, you know, why, why didn't you order um, a main course? Because she's sitting there with a main course, and and he's sitting there with a, a soup and bread. Um, and, and, and what he said was that um, I, um, uh, I ate at home. And she said, why? Um, he said, so that you could eat whatever you wanted. And I just thought, oh my goodness, the power of just those few words, so that you can eat whatever you wanted. That those words communicated so much to her um, that actually she stood up and, and kissed him and married him as well. So just remember that. <laughs> if you want to marry someone, <laughs> think about your words carefully. But uh, isn't it just such, such a beautiful story? I mean, it touched me deeply so much that I actually stopped the film. And then I dragged Maria down. I said, you've got to watch this film now. Let's rewind it. And she said, I don't want to watch the film. But she loved it. She loved it in the end. Now, I appreciate that what I've shared this morning is, is hard-hitting, but it's good to be challenged by the Word of God and in an area where God's people really do need to think very, very carefully. Uh, and so I'm going to give you a moment just to reflect on what I've shared, and then I will bring a prayer uh, of repentance. Let us pray. Loving Father, all the fancy words in the world expressed in eloquent prose, decorated with emotion, spoken with conviction, cannot compete with a heartfelt sorry when all other words fail. This is a moment when we are all too aware of our limitations, conscious of sin and the distance it creates between us. Sometimes sorry is all the heart can bear to say aloud. It is only you who can read and understand the language of our hearts. Only you who can translate our sorry into the prayer we would have prayed if we had the words within us. And then you forgive, and having forgiven, surround us in an embrace of love, drawing us close to your heart as it was always meant to be, Thank you, loving Father, for it is only by grace that we can enter, only by grace we can stand, not by our human endeavor, but by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Amen.